Hello. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mikhail Rebecca. I'm, I'm a commissioning editor at Fighting Press. And um, I would like to welcome you here for a special event, which is part of Sotheby's Autumn Talks. It's a series organized in, uh, in collaboration with uh, Intelligence Square. Today, we are going to be focusing on contemporary art, and uh, I'm delighted to have with me an artist and a collector whom I'm sure I'm going to have a, um, a very interesting and wide-ranging conversation. So joining us from Los Angeles, California, is Sterling Ruby. Um, Sterling Ruby is an artist known for the wide variety of different media that he uses, from ceramics and paintings and drawings and installations. And uh, he's, one of the, he's one of the artists that I've been privileged to work with. Um, I've commissioned a, a book within the Contemporary Artist Series at Fidon with him in 2016, a series that today is celebrating its 25th anniversary. Sterling, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi there. Um, also from Los Angeles, California, we have Fai Kadra. Uh, Fai is a collector, artist, creative director who has created stage designs for the likes of Drake, Sid, Summer Walker, Zapferg, and Buddy. And um, he's collaborated with uh, fashion houses around the world, including Dior, Alexander Wang, Montclair, and Louis Vuitton. Um, Fai is also a musician in his own right, and uh, he has been featured on the projects by Blood Orange. And um, he is this year's guest curator of, um, of uh, a Sotheby's Contemporary Curated Sale here in London. Fai, hi, welcome, thanks for being here tonight. And here in London, you have me, of course, but but most importantly, you will also have Ashkan Bagistani. Um, Ashkan is the head of Sotheby's London Contemporary Curated Sale and director for Middle Eastern and Contemporary Art. Ashkan, welcome. Hi, Thanks for Hi everyone. Us. Hi, lovely to be here. Sterling, I'm going to start with you. Uh, it's great to have uh, you know. Uh, Sterling and I had work on, on 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 this book together in 2016, so we spent quite a lot of time um, discussing his work. And uh, but we never spoke about it in a in a public context before. So this is quite exciting. Um, so Sterling, I guess I would like to start by talking about something that stayed with me during our many conversations, which was. Um, your early career trajectory. Um, I do remember you telling me that when you grew up uh, in, uh, in in rural Pennsylvania, uh, in the booming American hardcore music scene that was around in DC at the time um, was very inspiring for you. And I, I would like to know more about that. Um, well, um, hmm. yeah, I, I um I grew up in, in an extremely small, uh, rural, predominantly Amish part of Pennsylvania. It was extremely conservative and predominantly white. Um, and there were, there were very, you know, heavy set, um, you know, kind of community um, beliefs, you know, specifically towards men being laborers and, uh, you know, women being sewers. And, you know, this was something that, um, you know, that in of itself, I, uh, I really, I always wanted an out. And, you know, my parents knew that. And they had this rule that I could go to Washington, D.C. or Baltimore on the weekdays uh, as long as I got up in time to go to school. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of friends who were older and who drove. Um, this was probably during the early, you know, or mid 80s to early 90s, this would be the uh, the Reagan and Bush years, really. And I was, um, I was lucky enough at a very early age to, to kind of, you know, start to see this scene, um, you know, you know, blow up over time. And I was lucky enough at that age to be able to see bands like Minor Threat or Bad Brains, uh, Black Flag. And, you know, it, it hasn't really been until recent, you know, probably the past 10 to 20 years where I've realized that that had a significant, um, you know, kind of importance to me as an artist. Um, you know, there was no art where I grew up. There was, 
only craft. Um, there was no music scene. And so to be able to get out and to experience this had a lot of uh, impact on me, not only from the kind of political uh, aspect of that, but also the kind of visual culture in the DIY movement, such as posters and flyers and, and albums. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I do remember especially uh, um, Raymond Pettibon famously designed the Black Flag logo, as you just you mentioned, which was quite, which was so impressive to me, the, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, these four pistons conveying this sort of movement and at, at the same time representing the black flag. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, for me, there was, there was, I didn't actually realize that that was happening, that, you know, I was being, you know, kind of like um, entered into a movement that had a lot of um, uh, politic and kind of, um, um, you know this this kind of stance against the the government and against and against um, you know uh, America and against you know this kind of middle uh, conservative uh, you know kind of um, ideology that was so prevalent at the time and it's you know weirdly so prevalent now. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Um, Fai, would you like to tell us a bit about your background? Um, yeah, I mean, I was born here in Los Angeles and I've grown up in you know, a couple of different places in the world, in London and Dubai. And, um, you know, for me, I've always been interested in, and I, you know, in kind of multidisciplinary and multi, uh, in ways in which having a creative outlook can expand itself into different um, fields, whether it's architecture, music, stage design, fashion, to me, it's just uh, kind of more about a perspective. And, you know, so I think that could, that's kind of manifested itself in my life today. So when I, when I was working with Sterling on his book, um, we, we have a section in our, in our, um, in our monographs, which is called Studio Visit. And I, as far as I know, I think it was the first time, Sterling, that your studio was, was, uh, uh, visually represented in a, in a publication, and uh, to me that was very important because I know that the studio obviously plays a key role with, in in your practice. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit more about what it represents for you as a space. Um, yeah, the you know the studio is um, you know the, the the studio is has a lot of space, and space is freedom. Uh, it's also a privilege, um, you know, again, it's also somewhat reminiscent of, of where I grew up, um, you know, we had no neighbors, you know, there was miles and miles and miles of land to the, to the next neighbor, you know, it, it took me an hour on a bus to get to school. And so this, this idea of expansive space um, was something that I kind of yearned for, you know, after having really solidified my, my time in Los Angeles. Uh, my wife, Melanie, had done a Chinati residency at the Judd Foundation. And, um, you know, I went down and I, I just kind of, I came back to Los Angeles wanting what he had kind of set up for himself, which was space. And uh, over the course of a number of years, we found a building that um, you know, was large enough to almost recreate this kind of uh, Bauhaus model that, you know, I could have rooms in different production areas for different mediums. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, again, like this, this kind of thing that I think a lot of artists, my generation and even younger are kind of considering, you know, after having such a kind of conceptual performance-based history prior to, you know, my coming of age, I guess, there was something that was very desirable about making something and about working with materials and kind of um, setting up a studio space that you went to every day and spent time in. Fai, you've been to Sterling's uh, studio, right? Uh, what impression did it have on you? Yeah, I have been to Sterling's uh, downtown. Uh, LA and I 
was honestly extremely impressed by just that what you're talking about is the amount of space you had and the way you were able to kind of compartmentalize each area for a different medium. But then for me, what was really interesting was kind of walking through the different spaces and seeing how the different mediums started to kind of inform each other in different ways and uh, how some of the soft sculptures then became bronze sculptures outside and but still have the same feeling. And um, I think you're very, I notice you're very organized with all the ceramic <laughs> tiling and all <laughs> things really well organized, which is, which is I think is great. <laughs> Because the studio sometimes can be super, super messy, so you kept it really pristine. <laughs> it's been it's been nice. I I um, somebody somebody a, a curator a few years ago actually you know kind of explained it to me. He was like, "Well, you're you're a Quaker, you know you you, you have uh, you have all of this this orderly you know kind of uh, you know conditioning to you that um, you know you wind up." Uh, you, even your messy space are compartmentalized. Yeah, and I think what was really interesting was seeing how alive the studio was. You know, you had a photo shoot going on at the same time for your brand in a different room. You know, there's ceramics being being um, you know in the kiln being made, and it just it felt very alive and really um, kind of like a great experimental space for you to kind of work. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> And um, Fai, I think I mean obviously you are you are a huge fan of Sterling's work, and I um, I think you own one of his pieces. Is that correct? Yes, I just um, I actually bought from Sotheby's uh, stalagmite piece, which is right there. And um, you know I I've always loved the series um, just because of how ambitious it was. Um, and you know lo looking at it looking at it online, I thought okay, it looks about twelve feet tall. Um, and after I had purchased it, and really looked at the dimensions, I realized 19 feet. So, um, Fai, how did you? How well? Let's bring Ashkan into the conversation. Fai, how 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 have you met Ashkan? Well, Ashkan actually reached out to me um, a little bit okay. ago to. To, to you know to potentially participate in, in the contemporary curated series and I always thought it was a really interesting series and I always um, love the idea of having some you know somebody curate a sale um, and I think what our goal really was the sale was really to open it up to a younger audience a lot of times these these sales have such incredible masterpieces, but you know, they start at millions and millions of dollars. And so they sometimes feel inaccessible or just unattainable in some ways. And so I think our goal with this sale in particular was really to have works by great artists, but some, you know, works that were more accessible to a younger audience or a new collector, um, because that's, you know, that's who I am as well, you know? So um, it felt really honest and really true to that. So I'm really proud of it. And I'm Right. Well, I was gonna... very excited when uh, when um, when Fai agreed to a partner up, but the, when you acquired the Stellung movie, it was a perfect coincidence because we were continuously chatting about the curated sale, and then suddenly I see your name pop up on uh, on the buyers list for this piece, and it was it was a great sort of conversation um, <laughs> after that. And you you went right. to see it uh, at our warehouse when you came to London, which I think you were a yeah. bit impressed by the size of it. Right. So, well, we're going to talk a bit more about your collaboration yes. later, but I'd like to go, to go back to Sterling for a second. Um, Sterling, one thing I, I've noticed when I was working with you, and for quite a lot of people know this already, is that you are, you seem to be conversant with a, with a, with a, with a, with a, lo with a large number of different media. And, um, and I was wondering, how do you choose the best way to represent an idea. You, what's the starting point? Do you have a favorite medium at all? And what's the, I guess, no, I would like to know also <laughs> how to drive behind this variety. Sorry, carry on. I don't necessarily have a, a medium that is uh, my favorite, per se. Um, you know, I, I feel 
as though working in this kind of interdisciplinary manner is is relatively manic and it kind of matches my my personality um it's not that i'm opposed to want making one particular type of work in one medium for the rest of your life it's just that's not how i'm hardwired um i also think that you know mediums in a way are um you know have they have their own histories they're ha they have their own um you know the materials and mediums are dependent on how they are recognized in the world at large you know i mean sewing has its own history and is associated with domesticity and and craft um you know bronze sculptures uh are a lineage of monuments and and like civic statues um you know i guess if you know clay has a relationship to art therapy and and childhood development so in a way there's always a, a jumping off point that a material seems useful to me because it's so recognizable and in that way you can kind of screw with that and you can push that recognizability and you can you can also you know kind of mess with uh you know where you you, you see that medium being in the next right 100 years right and you also have the spray paintings of course that they, they themselves are uh, you know have strong association with street art and Without a doubt. I mean, the spray paintings, you know, uh, were for me very much about what I saw every single day in the in the neighborhood right. that I lived in. Um, and there was like these kind of like power um, structures embedded into graffiti. But it also it just it became a medium for me, much like any other painting medium. And I was able to kind of look at it in a very didactic way to make these landscapes and so forth. Right. But overall, I always think that a medium has some sort of uh, theoretical, like kind of context to it that helps me, you know, kind of make those decisions what to use. Right. Um, one of my favorite groups of works of yours um, is the Flag series. Um, I've been busy working on a, on, on a project about the, the, the American flag for some time. I don't know if you will ever, ever come to anything, but I, um, I was wondering um, how, what was the decision behind, what was the, you know, the driving force behind your decision to, to work with the flag? I think it's, uh, you know, especially considering that there are historic, historical precedents like, you know, Jasper Jones uh, 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 is, is the first that, 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 uh, that uh, might come to mind, but there are others like David Hammonds or, uh, you know, Thornton Deal or uh, even John Hendricks when he, he organized a very iconic show in the 60s about the desecration of the flag. So what does the flag represent to you, especially in this time and age? I, you know, I agree with you that, that art historically, um, you know, particularly the American flag represents this kind of like protest formalism that it's identifiable in its in its shape uh, as this kind of way to use formal protest. Um, the iconography, the nationalism of it, um, you know, for me, it also ties into the fact that, you know, I originally got into sewing um, by modifying my own clothes uh, with the sewing machine that was given to me by my mom when I was 13. And, you know, I would wear these clothes to school, um, you know, you know, and it, it caused a lot of problems. It was it was it was a very early education for me that like there are these boundaries that a lot of people have in terms of what uh, can happen with, uh, you know, a sewing machine. Um, and, you know, I use that kind of misconception of my, you know, my community as as a kind of like protest in a way. And, you know, I recognize the values in crafts and particularly quilt making. And now as a contemporary artist, I think that what's happening is that all of these different um, craft movements, particularly in the United States, are being reassessed. Uh, and they're being reassessed in a way that starts to rival them against the art historical movements of, say, you know, abstract expressionism or, or minimalism. I mean... You know, you can see that happening right now in MoMA. Things are being hung 
next to sculptures that aren't sculptures or paintings. They're, you know, design elements, they're um, quilts, they're crafts. Um, and I think that that's very important for me and my kind of history because all those things kind of get wrapped up and the flag is, an, is, is, a, is a kind of means of, of using that formalism and that history. Um, it's interesting that you just, what you were saying about um, working with, with, a, with a student machine when you were 13. Um, that, I guess, brings me to your to a, a, another um, creative that you've been involved with for the past 10, 15 years, which is fashion. Uh, would you like to talk a bit more about your relationship with the fashion world and how, uh, how that came about? Um, yeah, it's, I, you know, again, I, uh, I, I guess I was participating in fashion when I was 13 and I just didn't know it. Um, you know, I think that in a way growing up, I didn't, you know, fashion almost seemed like it, it was like something that was fictional, you know, it wasn't anything that we had or that we were close to. Same thing with art. Art seemed like something that, you know, only, you know, uh, you know, certain people of the past got to do. It didn't seem real to me. Um, but, you know, what's what's interesting is like, you know, similar to what Phi, you know, was, was kind of commenting on is that we're at a point that a lot of younger people look at fashion, look at music, look at TV series, look at movies the exact same way and the exact same weight that they look at art. And, you know, it wasn't until, um, you know, I met all of my future friends like Ralph Simmons or Rick Owens or Michelle LeMay, you know, Matthew Blaise, uh, Peter Mullier, who all kind of taught me that, um, you know, their thought process and their construction process was just as uh, vigorous and, and just as, uh, uh, you know, kind of theoretical as, as any artist, um, that these things were thoughtful and, and it was a way for me to make something that, uh, people could wear almost as a performance. And, and also, you know, again, like Fi was saying something that, um, could be attainable from a much larger, maybe even younger audience. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and I, oh, there you go. <laughs> That's why the end. <laughs> I want one. They're amazing. <laughs> and uh, well, I guess is, you know, tell me more about that. Tell me more about your. Uh, uh, how you going about collecting? Um, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I've always um, my my mom uh, has had a store since I was really young, so I've always been around the fashion industry and always um, like kind of grew up with fashion around me. So um, I think it's a beautiful way to um, express yourself and kind of and I think. Just like Sterling said, there's, there's been such a huge shift in the fashion world to kind of, um, kind of like pop art. And it's, it's like even the way, you know, I think Kim, as artistic director of Dior, every season is almost a, a different artist collaboration. And I think that's just, you know, a pioneering way in the way fashion and, and art have, have kind of become married in a sense. And they've, they've always been married, but I think just maybe more obvious um yeah. today i think i think yeah. you know one of the things that that fi and i are kind of like talking about is hierarchies um you know that that all of these hierarchies are starting to break down it's kind of i mean you know considering everything that's going on right now it's an amazing point in time because all of these things are being kind of leveled out and looked at in the same in the same way, um, and I kind of love that. I, I I think of that as collage. You know, I think of that as um, you know this this kind of roll to flatten, uh, similar to the way that the Bauhaus movement did. That things are now 
of equal equal weight. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess the difference though is also that you need hundreds of thousands of people to to make a fashion item successful. You only need one person to make an artwork successful. <laughs> I don't know. We're trying with a very small team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, as I as I was saying before, uh, Sterling and I worked together on a, on a on a book within the contemporary artist series, and I, um, um, you know, uh, to me that was a particularly rewarding experience for a number of reasons. And one was that um, and up until then, Sterling, you mostly made uh, project-oriented books. Um, they were really good, but you were really involved in shaping them from beginning to end, uh, and I. You know, I felt there was room to make something different in the sense of, of you know, of putting together a publication that was a little more comprehensive and would add, and kind of tell the full story, at least up to that point in time. Uh, but of course, you know, I I understand that every time I invite an artist to work with me, I understand that you know, you know, the series has a very strict form. There are six chapters. There is a, there is a, um, and so I, you know, there are very very specific guidelines to follow and I was wondering how how did you feel about that how did you respond to that when when you got the invitation um you know I was very happy when you invited me to do it um <laughs> uh, you know for me <laughs> books you know books are are like they're they're very important to me I mean we're you know Michaela you and I are from a generation that um we didn't have you know Google searches, you know, when, you know, we were, we were you know, at, an, at a particular age. Um, and books were always, to me, something that was accessible and visual and, you know, as a, almost as a means of collecting the same way that you would collect a record and, you know. And, you know, it's also, I didn't, you know, I, I remember the contemporary, the fight and contemporary artist series because it's the first time that I bought a Jenny Holzer book. Uh, it was right. the first time that I that I bought, you know, a Mike Kelly book. Um, and for me, you know, I, over the years, I had been making these singular books, you know, that why, were either representative of an exhibition or one particular series of art. And, you know, my what I do is very, uh, you know, it's kind of all over the place. So, you know, it I found it very fortunate and very helpful to have a book like the Fight on Contemporary Artist series that shows that over the course of a 20 year trajectory, um, that there was a lineage to everything, even though it may have been completely at odds with one another when you put a painting next to a sculpture or a geometric sculpture next to a you know ceramic anthropomorphic sculpture. It, it was like the first opportunity that I got to hold something that kind of showed and explained uh, in visual uh, context how my work operates. It was also, you know, I have to say that working with you and, you know, kind of being able to be choosy um, uh, about who writes about my work. And so we got to choose people, curators and writers and critics who have been with me the whole time, my friends, you know. And so in a weird way, it's it, you get to be able to put together this thing that is a true representation of of like uh, a, a period of time, a survey almost. Yeah, no, I, I was I was especially grateful that you gave me you gave me an opportunity to work with Franklin Sermons, who was one of the contributors to the book, because Franklin has been one of my one of my oldest acquaintances, and friends, and within the contemporary art world. So. Uh, but we never had a chance to work together on one of these books. So uh, when his name came up in conversation, I was over the moon. I was like, oh, this is going to be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, uh, I know, and it was. Uh, I mean, it, you know, we, it took a long time, but it, it really was a, a super intimate um, you know, project to put together. Yeah, yeah. It, it does take a long time. I mean, I think a lot of – this is another thing I normally say to artists when I invite them. To work with me on one of these books is that you know it's not it's not an exhibition catalog it's not you know the uh, it, it will take some time to get there normally it takes about 16 18 months <laughs> to yeah. see the book to print but uh you know but it's um 
Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you say that you, you recognize the critical framework that the series was offering to your work. Uh, that was that, that is very nice to hear. Um, series that, as I said, this year has been the 25th anniversary, so we are uh, in celebration mode, and um, and we also have a couple of. Uh, um, actually, I wanted to ask you, Fai, um, do you collect books as well as art? Um. Yes, I do. And I, I mean, I have so many of these fight on books, like Sterling was said, it was the first time I was introduced to a lot of these artists and saw some of these works was through those books. And they've been, I mean, I, I, I have, you know, so many of them and I, and I love them all because they are so comprehensive. Um, but, you know, I think collecting art is, is, you know, similar to like collecting books. It's a very like personal experience. It's a, it's something that, you know, as you go and, and change things, you're, want to acquire work, change, um, and I think that's part of the beauty of collecting. And I think, you know, once you start really living with art in your home and art around you, it just becomes addicting. And I think, you know, you just kind of want to accumulate more and more. <laughs> uh, Michele, what are your upcoming artists for the contemporary um, series? About, sorry? What are your upcoming artists for the... Oh, books coming um, out within the contemporary artist series. Oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, well, we, um, we have a... Uh, well, the next two uh, to come out are, um, are on uh, Cecily Brown and Adam Pendleton. They're just, uh, they're just being released right now, actually, as we speak. And, uh, and we have another one coming up next spring, that, and that's a monograph on Jim Hodges. So these are the next three... Uh, in line, uh, it's always a little. It's always a little confusing for me to say exactly what I'm working on and what, and, uh, and uh, what is coming up because I'm normally on something like 16, 16 books at the same time. Obviously, they're on different stages. Uh, some of them are just being commissioned. Some of them are in the process of of, of being designed. Some of them are uh, are about to come out. But uh, yeah, these three are the ones that are that are next in line. And uh, Ash, so since uh, since you asked me a question, I'm going to ask you a question. It's about time. So tell me more about uh, sort of his contemporary curated. Um, so they're they're sort of bi seasonal uh, sales, and and I love working on on these projects because every um, sale has a different identity depending on the guest curator we have, and they've been going on for a few years now between New York, London, and Hong Kong, um, and. We, we wanted for this uh, fall sale to think of uh, something a bit different, um, and, and um, that's when uh, Phi came into the picture where we wanted someone that speaks to the new generation, and I've been following him uh, throughout his uh, social, um, well, Instagram account, um, his posts and his passion for arts, and, and I thought, you know, he has a very interesting background between Dubai, London, and, and, and LA, and talking to this LA scene, but also knowing very much what's happening in London. And I thought the collaboration and the synergy between both cities would have been very interesting. So we, we got in touch and uh, when uh, Fai was in London, we met and we discussed and he kept telling me that uh, Donald Judd and Bruce Nauman were really his like favorite artists and, and we should try to focus on those. So we tried to get uh, those artists into the sale, but it was a bit more complicated. Um, but um, we, we have a great sort of rostrum of, of works, including this wonderful Damien Hurst behind me. Um, and, uh, and we were just very excited to collaborate um, to with someone. Very hard to me. <laughs> and it actually spins. I've turned it off so it doesn't hurt anyone's eyes. But uh, no, and it's great. It, it, you know, these projects are great because, again, you, you get to have a different flavor for, for every sale, and and we had in the past Massimo Bottura, for example, in uh, uh, The Famous Chef, and he, he related his cooking and his passion for the arts and arte povera to, to what he does, and and um, so it's great. They're, they're really fun projects, and it was great working with uh, with Fai on this and, and to see what his 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 eye is and, and try to work together on, on establishing a nice uh, group of works and promoting them together. Um, and this is actually a Palestinian artist um, who just had a show in, in, in Korea, Shomali. Um, and yeah, so uh, we, we, we have about a few days left. Uh, the sale is on the 24th of November in London and um, fully online. So I invite you to go have a look and, uh, and 
take a peek. Fai, how did you feel when you were invited to be the guest curator for this year? Um, I mean, it was de- I was it was definitely like an honor to be invited to do it. I um, you know I've been following the other other people who have done it in the past, and I've always um, loved the series. And you know, I think like I said before, I think it was really important for for me to kind of try to have a sale that felt more accessible and felt um, you know younger in a sense to. For people to, to be able to really participate into, in, in the sale. Right. And the, um, Ash, the contemporary curated sale in London is. Um... On the 24th of November. All right. Next okay. Tuesday uh, at 2 24th. p.m. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. We have a limited preview, but unfortunately it's not open to the public. But um, we'll put as much as we can on social media. Yeah, I guess that was. I guess that brings me to the next question for you, Sterling, and that is, uh, you know, in normal circumstances, I would ask you about your upcoming projects, but you know, circumstances are not normal, as we all know. Uh, this has been a very, a very particular year, and um, I, I guess, I'm curious to know how how you've been dealing with with, with the current climate. You know, did it kind of contribute to you know? You know, reshaping some of your ideas or or, uh, or future plans. Um, you know, I, I guess you know to a certain extent since March, um, you know, every everything has has really changed for us. Um, you know, I I think uh, you know by the time the the end of April uh, came around, I I don't know. I had this I had this sense that. Um, you know, all of this was should be this kind of reflexive and, and even self-reflexive kind of time to kind of reassess where everything was and to kind of slow down. Um, I really, you know, in the end, I, I kind of very early in this, um, you know, thought it would be a shame if after all of this, everything just went back to the way it was or went back to normal. Um, and I, I think it's going to have a lasting effect on not only me, but probably a lot of the people that I work with. And we are going to do things differently. And, and you know, but it, it really has just been a time for me to slow down and kind of step back a bit and, and kind of reassess um, how to move forward. Fai, same question? I, I agree. I think it's been such, a, such an important time to really um, kind of just take a look at the way, you know, we were moving, I think, at an unprecedentedly fast in terms of flight, flight around it in a really fast-paced way. And I think this time has really forced everyone to kind of step back and reassess and prioritize all the things that really are important. And um, and I think that's super important. And I, and I think having you know, these difficult times only creates for better art, really. You know, a lot of, you know, just when we look at art history, you know, it's kind of going through the Great Depression or all these different movements, artists have really taken on those difficult subjects and have created beauty out of it and have created incredible works out of it. And I think, you know, taking, for artists to take the time right now to really digest this time and then, you know, in the next coming, in the in, you know, next coming years and the future is to really, then be able to reflect on it and create works that, you know, speak to the way they felt during this time. Right. Um, yeah, I guess, sorry, that brings me to something um, kind of unrelated, but I, um, how did you, how did you struggle that thing? Well, I think, um, you know, my parents are, my parents are collectors and I think I've always kind of grown up uh, around art and, you know, I've always kind of wanted to start my own collection. So, um, you know, it was always interesting to see, you know, going to different museums and going to different galleries, all the kind of pieces that I would one day hope right. to live with, of course, you know. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it's still it's still a process. I mean, there's a, there's a place here in LA that I really love and I, you know anyone that comes to visit me in LA I try to take them to it's this place called the Wiseman Foundation uh, and it's this home in Beverly Hills 
and he was just a great collector um, really early on and has, you know, since his passing has turned his home into a foundation. And so it's, it's a free tour for anyone to go in and, um, you know, just walking through this home in Beverly Hills and seeing all these incredible, you know, you walk in the foyer, there's like a beautiful Clifford still in the next room, there's a Rothko and a de Kooning and a Bacon and all these um, Oldenburgs and all these beautiful works. I mean, every part of the house, every corner is filled with a painting. I mean, this, there's works on the ceilings, you know? So, um, right. so I, you know, kind of have, you know, I think it's such a beautiful story to have a collector like that who kept all his collection in his home and has opened it up as a foundation for people to come and see how beautiful it is, how important it is to live with art. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's, I think, you know, uh, you know, Fai's gesture of, of, you know, uh, wanting to live with art is actually, I mean, for me, a very important kind of intimate, um, you know, message. I mean, as an artist, I, um, I really love the fact that, you know, that you might install a work of mine in your home in this kind of domestic, intimate setting and walk by it every day and kind of sometimes ignore it, sometimes glance over from the TV and look at it. Uh, other times just sit and stare at it. You know, to me, that's that's probably one of the um, uh, kindest, most, uh, y you know, uh, powerful um, means of, of kind of contributing to, 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 to the art is to look at it. Uh, and weirdly enough, I don't know if that always happens. And so, you know, Fai, thanks for cutting a hole in your roof to put the stalagmite in your house. <laughs> I think this, our, our, our time is up, sadly. Uh, I would have loved to continue, but that's where we are. So, well, thanks, Sterling. Thanks, Fai, and thanks, Ashkan, for, uh, for being here. Thanks for your brilliant Thank contribution you, to today's event. And uh, it was such a pleasure to see you all. And um, I would also like to thank Intelligence Squared for their help in pulling this all together. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching today. If you'd like more information on, on Sotheby's Contemporary Curated, it's currently open until, as Fai and Ash said, the 24th of November. Um, please go to salibis.com, London Curated, if you want to know more. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure, and I uh, hope to see you guys again soon, hopefully in person. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you very Good much. Night. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see you Bye. all. Thank you. <laughs>